So Tim is traveling, and so my mom actually volunteered to open up the class for us. So praise God for that. <laughs> if you don't know her, this is Kathy Rosier. This is my mom. So come on up, mom. <laughs> We're going to read today's text, and then we'll pray and get started, okay? So if you have your Bibles, open them up to our text for today, which is 2 Timothy. We're going to start at 3.10, and we're going to go to 4.5. He's not going to teach all of those today. <laughs> We'd have to be here for dinner. But, um, okay. 3.10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine. This is Paul talking to Timothy. The manner of life, the purpose, the faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at uh, Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. <clears throat> and out of them, all of the Lord delivered me. Amen. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Amen. Chapter 4, we're going to read the 5, go through 5. Verse 5. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. On, yes. Praise God. Go, okay. <laughs> I got dry mouth there. <laughs> anyway, let's pray real quick. Lord, we just thank you for this time. We pray for your anointing on Zach as he teaches your word. We pray that our ears would be open to receive your word, that we receive your word, that we would be fully equipped, Lord, that we could go forth and do your ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Thank you, Mom. So we're studying 2 Timothy, as you know, and so we're, these verses that Kathy just read, that Mom just read, is the pinnacle of the letter. It's like this climax of the book that, he's, that Paul's bringing us to, and it's everything that he's uh, trying to get Timothy to know and understand and be equipped for, uh, for fighting false teaching, for responding to false teachers, for and equipping himself for standing and bringing the church back up on his feet, and that's the church of Ephesus. So that's what, we're in the pinnacle of the letter now. And so last week we finished up chapter three. And so last week we moved, when we did chapter three, now we're moving into chapter four. And we're seeing Paul bringing this letter to a close. And this is his final letter that he'll write in his entire life. And so really what we're doing is we're reading Paul's final words that he ever wrote in his entire life. And these are precious words, and he's building up to the climax of what he's about ready to say. So this is the last letter he's ever going to write. Paul's finalizing, and he, he concludes with the most emphatic exhortation that he can possibly make. 
And that's what we're leading up to. And he's really building up to this point. And it's this, this emphatic exhortation he can make in 2 Timothy, I would say, because, of course, Paul made a lot of emphatic exhortations. I would say this is the climax of the book of 2 Timothy right here is what we're getting ready to go into and lead, lead into. So he directs this conclusion towards the most important mandate that we have as Christians, and that is to preach the word. That's, that's the motivation that we all have. That's the mandate that we have as Christians to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to preach the word. And the word is the logos who, who became flesh and dwelt among us. And we proclaim that. That's why we're here on this earth still is so we can preach the word of God. So God's word, it's the absolute absolute most important thing that we have in this life. I think we all agree this Bible and his word, the Logos, is the most important thing we have because it's what connects us to, to him. It's what connects us to Jesus Christ. That's why it's the most important. And it's the most important thing to come for all eternity. Not this physical Bible, because we're not bringing this physical Bible with us, but it's the Logos, it's Jesus Christ himself is the most important thing that for all to come. And so that's why he, whenever he says preach the word, he's telling us preach Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we're doing. That's why this is so important. So this is Jesus Christ, the word of life that was manifested to us that we might have reconciliation with the Father and eternal life in him. That's why this is such an important statement that he's about ready to say. So for the past couple of weeks, we've been studying the importance and the purpose of the scriptures, the the written record of the Logos. That's what the scriptures are. So like Kathy said, the graphe, the graphe is the written record of the Logos and the Logos is the word. And so we have the, the written record here. So we can now have the understanding and the comprehension of the word of life himself. That's why we have the written record, so we can understand him, we can understand Jesus Christ. So this is the written record of the truth, because his word is truth, and Jesus Christ is truth, so this is the written record of the truth. The underlying theme of this entire second epistle has been to uphold truth without compromise. That's that's what we've been learning here. Uphold the truth without compromise. Don't compromise anything that the word of God tells us. Don't compromise our stance for the truth. And so as we learned in chapter three, Paul tells Timothy that the word of truth is how to respond to false teachers within the church. That's why he's writing this letter to, second Tim- to, to Timothy. That's why he's re- writing this second letter is to, is to make sure that Timothy is equipped to respond to false teachers because it's the teachers, it's these false teachers that have actually torn down the truth in this church of Ephesus. And, it's, and he says it in the very first, I think it was 115, uh, 2 Timothy 115, he says, all of Asia has, has moved away from me, has abandoned me because they've been swayed away from the truth. And so that's what these false teachers have done. And so what's happening in the church of Ephesus is they're swayed away from the truth because there's a, a massive amount of persecution coming against them and hostility towards the word of God, but they weren't standing on the truth. And so because of that, when persecution arose for the word's sake, they stumbled. And so that's Matthew 13. We went through that. And so now what we're learning is Paul's encouraging Timothy to take a stand for the truth and that the man of God must take a stance alongside God and away from unrighteousness. So that, that, that was chapter two. So we learned, okay, we got to take a stance alongside God and away from unrighteousness. So we must take the stance of separation, a, ta- a stance of sanctification from evil and the perversion of this world. And s- we do this so that we might be complete, being fully complete by the scriptures so that we can be fruitful in every good work, sanctified and useful to the master. That's what we've been learning. And that's that was the purpose of the scriptures, that we have a written record of the Logos so that we can be sanctified and fully complete and, and equipped to do every work and sanctified and useful for the master. So that's what we've been learning for the past uh, several months as we've been learning these three chapters in 2 Timothy. So now as we venture into chapter 4, Paul makes this solemn charge concerning the word of truth to his beloved son in the faith, and that's Timothy. 
And he's doing this for the purpose of keeping the body of Christ pure and undefiled from the world. That's why he's writing this letter so we can, he can get the church of Ephesus built back up in the truth and he can proclaim the gospel as, as time goes on because Paul knows that he is at the end of his life and he's handing off his mantle to his son Timothy. So Paul mandates in this final exhortation to Timothy in the most intense way in an effort that Timothy maintain that which was entrusted to him. Because if you remember, Paul was entrusted with the words of Jesus Christ and then he himself now has entrusted those same words to Timothy, his son. And like I've said, that's the only place in Scripture you actually see Paul entrust these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ into somebody else. It's more than just preaching the gospel. He actually entrusted these words to keep them safe. And he did that to his son, Timothy. He's expecting Timothy to take on the mantle that he started of preaching the word. So let's read verse one again. And this is where we're going to abide today is in verse one. There's so much here that we really need to lay a foundation for what he's about ready to say in the next few verses. So let's read verse one again. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, and then preach the word. See, that's, that's verse two, but that's what he's doing. Look at this statement that he's, he's making. I charge you therefore, and he's not just saying I charge you, I'm doing it before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That is a huge statement that he's about ready to make that he's doing this right now. And it's all geared towards preach the word. That's why this is so emphatic. So this idea that we're going to take this in steps, we're going to look at, I charge you, therefore, that's the first statement he makes. I charge you, therefore, this is diamarturamai un ego. Now what that means, diamarturamai, we're going to study that word out, but he, he, he says un ego, un is the word for therefore. And, and the reason why he's seeing, saying therefore is because he's drawing us back to what we just learned in the first three chapters, namely what we've learned in chapter three. Um, but he's taking the whole of what he's been writing to Timothy and he says, therefore do this. So if you read verse three, it kind of starts giving us an understanding of what this therefore is actually there for, right? Okay. So verse three, he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their itching ears or to, to according to their desires, they will have itching ears and they will heap up for themselves teachers. He's talking about a group of people, group of people here. He says, for they will. Well, you have to back up to verse 13 of chapter three to understand and who are these people? So that's why he's got this therefore is he's, he's linking it back to what he's already said in verse 13. And so you go back to verse 13 and he says this, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So that makes sense now. He says in verse three, for the time will come will, when they will not endure sound doctrine. Well, who is they? Who they are, the evil men and imposters who are heaping upon the worse. They're, they're, they're you know, deceiving and being deceived. They're false teachers that are infiltrating into the truth. So that's who they are. And now he just came off of verse 16 and 17 and he's telling us that it's all scripture that, that helps us stand and respond against these people. And so that's why he is, he's saying this therefore is because everything we just learned about responding to, the, responding to these false teachers by the truth is done by the scriptures. Okay, so this therefore, it's how we use the word of God to respond to false teachers. And we've seen this in the first three chapters. So just a recap here, and we're not going to go through all of them, but let me just give you a couple of examples of where we see Timothy uh, understanding, getting the, the, the words from Paul on how to respond to false teachers. So go with me to 1, 2 Timothy 1.13. And he says here, he says, hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Hold fast the pattern of sound words. That's the truth. That's what he's saying. Hold fast. Make sure that those words that are entrusted to you, the truth of the word of God, make sure you hold fast this pattern of pure doctrine. 
And then he goes into 14. That good thing which was committed to you, those are the words of Jesus Christ, keep them, hold them fast, guard them by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. So that's, that's verse 13 and 14. He starts off the letter telling him to make sure you hold fast the word of God. Now go to 2.14. He says, remind them, and actually in the Greek we learned that he's actually talking specifically to Timothy, and he says, I'm reminding you, Timothy, of these things, and I'm charging you before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. And then he goes on, but be diligent to present yourself approved to God. That's where that presents yourself. Stand alongside God, approved to God, be a, approved as genuine to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So this is how we respond to false teachers. And he says, but shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. So that's why we have the word of truth, is to gu we guard the word of truth, and we use it to respond to false teachers. And then, of course, 3, 14 through 16, which we studied the last couple of weeks. And so if you look at 14, but you, Timothy, continue or abide in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So what are the things that he's supposed to be abiding in? Abiding in the things he learned from Paul, and that's the gospel. That's the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and he says, and those things that you learned from childhood, which are the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, so which make us wise for salvation, and we have salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And all Scripture, all now, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is now is, is doing a work. It's the work of the Word, and it's given. It's God-breathed by God, and it's profitable for doctrine, that's for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's where, that's why he's given us his word, his scriptures, so that we can respond to false teachers and, and hold fast the word of truth. That's the idea here. So I charge you, therefore, dia marturamai un ego. So we talked about un, why he's saying therefore. Why is he saying therefore? We just talked about that. Now he's saying, he says, because you've been equipped with the word, and because I've taught you the word of God, and you've in, I've entrusted you with the words of life that were entrusted to me, therefore, I charge you, Timothy. So that's the basis. That's what he's saying. So when Paul says, I charge you, he's making a double emphatic. And I love bringing this up because you don't see this in the English language. And because what he's saying here is, dia marturamai is I charge you. And then he says, un ego. Now, ego is a double emphatic. Ego means I in the Greek. And so he could have simply said, dia marturamai un, I therefore charge you. That's, and that's exactly how you would translate it in the English. But he adds this word ego, which means I, we get the word ego from that, right? Egotistical, that, that's ego, a, ego is I, okay? It's the first person singular pronoun, meaning I. And so what he's doing is he's adding this ego to make a point. And what he's saying is, it's a double emphatic, saying that I, the apostle Paul, I thoroughly charge you. See, he's saying I twice. He says, I, I'm the Apostle Paul. I am your friend, your, your father in Christ, if you want to say it like that. That's, you know, weird. But you could say, I'm the one that brought you to the scriptures. Okay, I'm the Apostle Paul, and I am now therefore charging you. Okay, that's what he's saying here. That's why he's saying I twice. So, dia marturamai, this is a really special word, and I want to show it to you. He says, I thoroughly charge. Okay, dia marturamai. Now, we get the word martyreo, or martyr, from this. And so you can see it, I highlighted it in the yellow, or in the uh, green here. But dia marturamai, that word right there is martyr. And so we, this comes from the word marteo, which is right there. And so you can see, dia marturamai is, is the word martyr 
martyr or to testify. And so as we know, the word martyr actually grew into a different meaning because if you testified of Jesus Christ in the first century, if you're a witness of his glory, you were killed for saying that. That's how martyr turned into being a martyr as in dying for something you believe, dying for something you testify. So here, martyreo is literally, I'm testifying or I'm witnessing about something. Now, if you notice this, dia is a preposition in front of this word, and that means thorough. It means complete. I am thoroughly testifying. I'm completely testifying and witnessing to you. He's making this very emphatic to Timothy. Now, what's interesting about this word is that only Luke and Paul actually use this word in their writings. And I think this is really fascinating. I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but I'm going to mention it because if you think about Paul when he's writing this letter to Timothy, he's in a dungeon and he's he's writing this last letter. But remember what he says in 2 Timothy 4.11, Luke alone is with me. I believe what's happening here is Luke is actually writing down these words that Paul is saying. And so we see this, that Luke and Paul are the only ones that use this word dia marturamai. And actually, if you do a word study between all the words that Luke uses and all the words that Paul uses, they're not found in many of the other parts of the New Testament. And so I just think that's really amazing that Luke, we know, traveled with Paul for a long period of time. He was with him through all of his journeys or a lot of his journeys. And here he's with him at the end. And as Paul is writing this letter and, and speaking this, these words to, to, to Luke, Luke, I believe, is probably writing these words down. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, scholars, they actually think that the pastoral letters themselves were co-authored by Luke. And and it's because of this linguistical style. And so you see this. And so I think that's kind of a special, you see this relationship that Luke and Paul actually have together because they're, Paul, Luke isn't just an amanuensis. He's not just a scribe writing down the words of Paul. He's actually a friend of Paul. Paul's saying these words. And of course, they're all driven through the Holy Spirit. And then Luke is taking those words and he's writing those down. And you can see this co-authorship between Luke and Paul. And what another interesting thing is now, if you take all of Luke's writings and all of Paul's writings and you put those together, that's a huge part of our New Testament. So Luke and Paul wrote many, the majority of what we have is our New Testament, which is really, really kind of a fun thing. And just on a side note, Hebrews, I believe, was written that same way. Hebrews was written by Paul. And, but I believe that there's enough linguistical style there that it's Luke actually writing those words. And so it's an interesting thing. You see this co-authorship between Paul and Luke. So kind of a fun thing to think about. All right. So this word, dia marturamai. So get back to that. It's so much more than just telling something uh, to someone, right? This is an urgent admonition, testifying intensely and earnestly, testifying earnestly. It's this idea of I'm trying to get you, I'm trying to get you to know something. I'm testifying something to you. And so Luke, he used this word to describe the rich man in hell that's begging Lazarus to be raised from the dead and then sent back to his brothers. Remember that story in Luke 16. So let's read it. He says in Luke 16, 27, then he said, I beg you, therefore, this is the rich man speaking and he's speaking to Abraham. And he says, father, that you would send him to my father's house for I have five brothers that he may testify dia marturamai to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So he says that you can see this, what this earnest uh, thing is that he says, send my, uh, raise up Lazarus from the dead so that he can testify to my brothers so they know that this is not where you want to be. That's the idea behind dia marturamai is it's a thoroughly witnessing, right? That just shows the emphaticness behind this word. Okay, so Paul, he's used this word two other times in his letter. And so in 1 Timothy 5.21, he says, I charge you, dia marturamai, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with, without prejudice 
part with partiality. So notice that I charge you and he's doing it before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. Now go down to 2 Timothy 2.14. He says, I'm reminding you, reminding you of these things and charging you, Dio Marturamai, before the Lord, not to strive about words to, to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. These are intense, an intense testifying. And notice that what he's doing here in both times, it's before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in 2.14, he says it's before the Lord. So now that's what we see in 4.1. He's saying the same thing, idea marturamai, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the, who, who will judge the living and the dead at the appearing in his kingdom. And he says, preach the word. And so this is this emphaticness on what this word tells us. So he's, he's testifying earnestly and thoroughly charging before the Lord. Now, as if this word wasn't enough, dia marturamai is such an emphatic word, but he then takes the rest of verse 1 to explain how serious this is that what he's saying. I want you to see how Paul is leading up to this statement that he's going to make as preach the word. So he starts off with this double emphatic, dia marturamai. We just saw how important that is with the word ego, okay? And this intense, solemn charge. Now he places it before and exalts it among the highest thing that you can possibly say. He says, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You can't get any more serious than that statement right there. This is a monumentous statement and this is why I believe that this is the absolute most important statement in the letter, and it's to preach the word of God. That's what he's saying. So I want to spend the rest of the lesson now talking about what does he mean by this last statement. And we're going to break it up into three statements here, that he's charging Timothy before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, that's first, who will judge the living and the dead, and at the appearing and his kingdom. We're going to talk about that verse right there on how specific and how emphatic this actually is. So now this first one, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this has the idea of being in the presence or in the sight of God. If you're before God, you're in the presence and you're in the sight of God. And so he says something similar. I want you to turn with me to 1 Timothy 6.11. 1 Timothy 6.11, just back a couple of pages, and he says something very similar, and I, I notice this, that, so here he's writing his 2 Timothy, and he's, he's coming to the climax of his letter, and now in 1 Timothy, he does the same thing. He's at the very end of his letter, and he says almost an identical thing to say with this emphatic statement, and so let's read it. He says, verse 11, but you, Timothy, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So look at how emphatic he's getting ready to, he's saying this. He says, I urge you in the sight of God, right? That sounds just like I'm doing this. I'm, pre I'm charging you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Jesus Christ, who witnesses the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until, uh, uh, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. And he who is the blessed, the only potentate, the sovereign, he is the only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Look at how that correlates between what he's saying here, that he's charging Timothy before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And here we see a lot of the same words, before in the sight of God and Jesus Christ. And then he says, keep this commandment without spot and blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ appearing. We see that's the same exact word. And so he says, and then he gives what, who Jesus Christ is. He is sovereign. He's king of kings. 
He's Lord of Lords. He alone has immortality. He's dwelling in unapproachable light who no man has seen and whom be honor and everlasting power. So that was in 1 Timothy. Lay that over the top of what we're saying here. And that's this emphatic thing of what Paul is saying to Timothy. Okay. These are the words of God upheld and validated by God himself. By putting this before God, he's actually saying, I'm solemnly testifying and I'm putting this before Jesus Christ, before God. In the presence of God, Paul's testifying that these words are holy and they're got from God himself and they're confirmed by Jesus Christ. These are the words of God that he's saying here. So now let's go on. He says, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom? That's who, now he's describing Jesus Christ. So he, J- Jesus Christ is the judge of the living and the dead. So to keep on track with the intent of this letter, I don't want to get too far off topic here, but I do, I'm going to spend the rest of the lesson. We're going to be talking about these words right here about the righteous judge. That's what we're going to be talking because I think we need to know the righteous judgment that we have as Christians and, and that Jesus Christ is the righteous judge. And so this could literally be an entire series on eschatological thinking. We're just going to limit it to the last part of this lesson. Okay. So Paul's putting as much weight as he can behind what he's about ready to say. And so you can't get any bigger or any weightier than saying, you know, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who is only the righteous judge, and he will reign on his throne for all eternity. That's what he's saying here, that he's placing it, these words before Jesus Christ. So that's about as big as you can possibly get, right? So now what does Paul mean by the living and the dead? Well, I think it's exactly what it says it means. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can read a lot into that. And there are places in scripture that it says, if you're the living are those who are righteous and the dead are those who are unrighteous, it, that could be laid in here. But this is actually just saying simply those that are physically alive and physically dead. I think that's what he's saying. Now, what this emphasizes is the fact that no one can escape divine judgment. Whether you're alive or whether you've you've died, that pretty much encompasses every human being that's ever lived or has ever died, right? So you can't escape judgment from Jesus Christ just by dying, okay? So that's why I think he says this. The dead are going to be raised for judgment, and uh, those that are alive will face the judgment, okay? Either way, you're going to face judgment. So we need to know what judgment is he actually talking about? about in verse one. That's what, that's the question. Whenever he says he's going to judge the living and the dead, and we know Jesus is the righteous judge in this context, what judgment is Paul speaking of? And that's what we're going to look at. So there are three different, the timing makes a difference on what judgment we're talking about. And there are three main judgments that are, are going to be coming up in the future. And I hope the very near future, as all of us do, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the first judgment is the Bema Seat judgment. Okay, and we're going to go through, I'm going to explain some of these. Bema Seat judgment is the first judgment in chronological order that we are going to see as this divine judgment by the righteous judge. The second one is the sheep and goat judgment. And the third one we're going to see the, or we see in the scriptures, the great white throne judgment. Now, in all three of those judgments, Jesus is the righteous judge, and all judgment has been given to him by the Father. So go with me to Acts 10.42, and we're going to look at John 5 as well. So Acts 10.42, just want you to see this in Scripture of what the Father has placed on Jesus Christ as the righteous judge. So Acts 10.42. So this is, in context, Peter is speaking to Cornelius, and he's preaching Jesus Christ to Cornelius. And so he says in verse 42, and he commanded us, this is, and Jesus Christ commanded us to preach to the people and to testify, that is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. So right there, Peter tells us that Jesus Christ was ordained by God the Father to be the judge of the living and the dead. And then he goes on, he says in verse 43, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will have, will receive remission of sins. Okay, so that is, this is Jesus Christ that Peter's talking about. Now go with me to John 5, and we're going to hear this from Jesus' words himself. 
5.22. All right, so we're going to skip through a couple of verses in chapter 5. 5.22, he says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all, that all should honor the, the Son just as they honor the Father. Who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Okay, so that's the first thing we see in 22, that the Father has now given, has committed the judgment to the Son. Now go to 26. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son to have life in Himself. And He has given Him authority to execute judgment also, because He is the Son of Man. So again, the Father has executed and given judgment, given the, the authority of judgment to the Son. And then verse 30, I can of myself do nothing, this is Jesus talking, I can of myself do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I love seeing that tie together because you can see this unity that the Father and the Son have together. Okay, so here the Father gives the Son the authority to judge. <laughs> but then Jesus turns right around. He says, I can't do anything of myself. <laughs> He says, unless I hear the Father tell me. Look at this, this, we talk about being one. That's why it's one God. It's, it's, it's one God in three different persons because they are so in sync, right? But ultimately, Jesus Christ is the one that's judging, but he's just saying what the Father said, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's great. I love seeing that type of thing. But ultimately, Jesus, we see he is the righteous judge. So the first judgment the Bema Seat Judgment, this is only for the righteous in Christ Jesus. It's only for the faithful Christians. That's, that's all this Bema Seat Judgment is, is for. It's not for any unrighteous people. It's not for anybody who, who any, the only people here at this judgment are those that have confessed that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and they're faithful in Christ Jesus. So this, the timing on this now happens in heaven after the rapture, and it's before the second coming. So get that timing. It's after the rapture, and it's before the second coming. Okay, that's whenever this beam of seat judgment happens. And now this is important as we're understanding what judgment Paul's talking about, because we need to know the timing of these judgments. So what the beam of seat is, is it's an evaluation when rewards are given to the faithful, and we walk through the fire of Dakimazo. You've heard me say Dakimazo, Dakimion. For those of you that are new, Dakimazo is one of my favorite Greek words because it's a proven genuineness. It's an examination to be proven genuineness. It's, it's how we walk through the fire of life. That's what Dakimazo is. And so in here, the Bema Seat Judgment takes us through the final walk of fire, purifying ourselves, and it's examining us to prove our genuineness. This is the point whenever all sin and all selfish desires of this old man is burned completely away and we walk into glory being completely purified. That is, so we, we are walking in sanctification right now in this life, but we are never going to be purely sanctified until we walk through the fire of the Bema Seat, which completely purifies us, sanctifies us, and we walk into eternal life with purity and glory forever to be his bride, right? That's the idea here. That's the Bema Seat judgment. That's why this is so exciting for the Christian is that the Bema Seat judgment brings us into glory. We want to participate in this judgment. So judgment, this is really, um, it's not a judgment for for sin, it's a, it's a judgment on faithfulness. It's according to our faithfulness because Jesus bore our sin. So this is not something to do with a judgment on sin. This is a judgment according to our faithfulness to Jesus while we were on the earth. It's a, it's a judgment uh, concerning the condition of our heart towards God. And so because we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, I have a bunch of scriptures there just talking about what the Bema Seed is, and you can look th at those in the notes. So as we discussed last week, that God has predestined our good works and placed them in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Okay, we talked about that, and that's what the scriptures are there for, so we can be fully equipped so we can fulfill and perform these good works that he's placed in Christ. 
And notice that they're in Christ Jesus. He hasn't given it to us uh, directly. They're in Christ Jesus, and that's how we link ourselves to them. That's how we do the good works is through the Scripture in Christ Jesus. So this judgment, it's an evaluation of our performance towards these good works that God gave us. So I want you to think about this. The good works that he's predestined in Christ Jesus, I believe it's an evaluation on how did we perform those good works? How, did we, how were we faithful? He gave us good works to perform. Were we faithful in doing those good works? Okay, that's, I think, what he's telling us here. Remember the parable of the talents. Whenever the master gave the talents to the servants, and then whether they were faithful or not that, uh, with, with what he gave him, then he came back and he was judged, the servant was judged on how faithful was he with those talents. I believe that's a type of this Bema Seat evaluation, okay? So we, this is how rewards are determined here. So one, there's two things that are actually happening. Our old man is getting complete, completely burned away, but yet we also are being rewarded for our faithfulness towards him and our, and our, our good works towards him our faithfulness in Jesus Christ. So this is not a judgment on condemnation to hell. Those that are in Christ are judged through the blood of Jesus, and there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Romans 8, 1, and that word is katakrima. That katakrima is we are not judged to hell, and so there is no judgment to hell whenever you're in Christ Jesus. So the Bema Seat is this exciting time of fulfilling in the culmination of our sanctification process when we can be complete walking into glory with him. All right, so now the second judgment, the sheep and goat judgment. You guys have heard about this sheep and goat judgment. This is the judgment, and it judges the righteous and the unrighteous. The sheep are the righteous, and the goats are the unrighteous, and this now takes place on the earth, and it's after the second coming. It's whenever Jesus comes back, he reigns on this earth, for a thousand years, there's going to be a, the millennial reign. And before he sets up his kingdom, the first thing he does is he separates the sheep from the goats. That's the sheep and goat judgment. So this immediately follows the second coming before he sets up the millennial kingdom. This judgment, it judges the righteous and the unrighteous. And so the sheep and the goats. And so the sheep are the righteous whom he will honor with inheritance into the kingdom. So he's allowing the righteous into the kingdom because he's getting ready to set up his kingdom. And so he's allowing the sheep into his kingdom and the goats are the unrighteous that he will purge out of the kingdom. Okay, so that's this judgment here. Now he's separating the sheep from the goats. So this is Jesus displaying his authority as the righteous judge of the universe. And so we see this, Matthew 25, 31 is a, is a big one on that. Um, Daniel and, and uh, Acts and John speak to that a little bit. The last judgment, yeah, Jim, did you have a question? I'm confused. So the, the righteous that are, I'm confused with the sheep that are still here on earth versus the righteous that are part of the rapture. So... <laughs> I can't go into that right now because I actually wanted to, but we won't get through this lesson. That's an excellent question. And maybe as I go through, you will understand. But after class, we can talk about that because there is a separation. There's a separation of those Christians that go through the Bema seat and those Christians that are the righteous on this earth. It's a really big discussion, so we won't, I can't go into that, but that's an excellent point of view. What you can do is after this lesson, think about that idea and understand how does this play in? And maybe some of the things we talk about are going to answer that. Okay, the last one is the great white throne judgment. Now, this is a judgment for only the unrighteous. This is only those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Christians are not going to be at the great white throne judgment. This is only a judgment casting those who reject Jesus into the lake of fire. Okay, this is a bad place to be. None of us are going to be there. We have, right? So... <laughs> So the timing on this takes place after the millennial reign. So this is a thousand years in the future from the sheep and goat judgment. This is after Satan's released from his chains in the bottomless pit because Satan, during that millennial reign, Satan's chained for a thousand years. Satan gets released. The devil makes one final war with God like he thinks he can defeat God after a thousand years. And, and he, gets him, he gets one verse 
about that battle in Revelation, and basically fire comes down and annihilates them all. <laughs> I love that, right? It is a, he's locked up for a thousand years. He makes this big push to try and overtake God, and he's overtaken. He, yeah, it, fire comes down, and it annihilates him completely. So then... At the great white throne judgment now, then this is basically immediately after that, we have the, the judgment, in, and this is in heaven, because at this point, the earth now is, is done, so everybody actually goes up to heaven at the great white throne judgment, this is after the thousand years, and anybody not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire forever. Okay, so that's, that's in there. So those, the unrighteous that were judged at the sheep and goat judgment, those that are unrighteous are participating in this great white throne judgment a thousand years later. So you can kind of get this concept of what's happening. And just remind you, this is Jesus Christ judging. This is the righteous judge. This is our Lord and Savior doing this judgment. This is, and so if you think about now, and we're going to be going through 2 Timothy 4.1, how emphatic Paul is whenever he places that G it's before Jesus who will judge the living and the dead. That's emphatic because we just saw those three judgments are very powerful and it's Jesus Christ doing that and he's placing the, this statement before the righteous judge. Okay? So after learning these three judgments, just very quickly, kind of getting an understanding, which judgment would you say is Paul referring to in chapter 1? Verse you know, four, four, uh, chapter four, verse one. Well, it, it, so let's go on about that. Okay. <laughs> so this is kind of a fun thing. I wanted, I went through this same process this week and I wanted you to take this journey with me. That's why I'm kind of leading you the way I am, because I think it'd be fun to see, let's discover this together, right? So now we have to read into the text, and he helps us answer this question. He says, who will judge the living and the dead? When is this going to happen? Because timing's very important. It's at his appearing and his kingdom. All right. So now that, that kind of helps start dialing it in. This word at in the Greek is the word kata. Kata doesn't really mean at. It means according to or according with, or in accordance with. So you can read it like this. You can say that who will judge the living and the dead in accordance with his, his appearing and in accordance with his kingdom. It's in accordance with, you know, it doesn't, and so at is okay, but it doesn't really happen at, it's in accordance with. Okay, so that's, a, that's something we want to keep in mind. The word appearing is the word epiphania. And this means to shine upon. Now, the word is a compound of epi, which means upon. And so you can see this word epi right here, preposition. And then the root is phino. And so you can see it phinea. And so the root word is phino. And to, to phino means to shine. And so you put those together, and it means to shine upon. So I love that idea. So think about to shine upon something means you're revealing, you're manifesting, you're showing something, you're showing shining the light on something. And this is all about Jesus Christ. Well, John 1, remember we read that? <laughs> Here, let me just read it. Because this, the, now think about the appearing as a shining the light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined into the darkness, and the darkness didn't comprehend it. This is a shining of light. This is the epiphania. This is the appearing of Jesus Christ, and he's shining his light to the world. Now, this word epiphania, it's used six times in Paul's letters. And, and so in 2 Timothy 1.10, it's referred to what, what I just read in John, that it's referring to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Here, I'm going to flip over there. 2 Timothy 1.10. So you can just kind of get a feel for what this is. 2 Timothy 1.10. He says, but, but has now been revealed by the appearing, by the ephenia of our Savior, by the shining upon by our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Okay, so that in this case, 2 Timothy 1.10 is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We also see that this epiphania, this shining upon, happens at the end of the, uh, the end of the age, the second coming, whenever he says in 2 Thessalonians 2.8, whenever 
whenever he comes and he shines his light on the Antichrist, and the Antichrist is actually destroyed by the shining, by the appearing or the brightness of his coming. That word, brightness of his coming, is epiphania. He's shining upon. So Jesus comes at the end of the age, at the end of the tribulation, he shines his light on the earth, and the Antichrist is destroyed. That's, what, that's, that's the power that we're talking about with epiphania. And then he uses this word four other times. This is Paul specifically. He's using this four other times, and it's in reference to the rapture, the catching away of the church, okay? So, so, we, so here we know that, okay, it's either referring to the incarnation or the second coming or the rapture, okay? So that means that it dials this in where the, the judgment of the great white throne judgment is ruled out. So, it, because there is no appearing, there's no shining Jesus' light on those at the great white throne judgment. That, right, they're not, they're, they're done. Okay, so the only two judgments that are left is the Bema seat and the sheep and goat judgment that follow an appearing, okay? So both have, they both follow an epiphania of Jesus Christ. So now, if you read 2 Timothy 4.1 on its own, just, just on its own, you can infer that it may just it may be talking about the sheep and goat judgment. And there are many scholars that actually believe that this is the sheep and goat judgment. And the reason why is because he talks about his appearing and he talks about his kingdom. And so that fits with the sheep and goat judgment. But, but that's just if you read verse 1 on its own. Now, if you read the context of what's happening, I believe it's the Bema Seat judgment. So now I'm going to show you why I think it's different than what some scholars believe. And so the reason why, there's two reasons, is because Paul's speaking directly to Timothy. Timothy is a faithful brother in Christ. This is, he's talking about, you know, building up, being faithful in Christ Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an uplifting thing. I think the Bema Seat Judgment is encouraging, right? We just went through that. And then he uses some same language in verse 8. And so if you go to 2 Timothy 4.8, Read this with me. 2 Timothy 4.8. This is Paul's final send-off, right? And we're going to get to this in a few weeks. But he says in verse 8, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, that's who we're talking about, the righteous judge, who, who has given the laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also all who have loved his appearing. Also all who have loved his epiphania. We love, as Christians, we love the epiphania. We love his shining his light on us because that's the point whenever we get brought up to heaven. If you're the Antichrist, you don't love the epiphania because you're going to hell, <laughs> right? So, so, so here he says, he says the righteous judge is giving him the crown of righteousness and he is, and, and he's giving them on that day and he specifically is naming that day and who have loved his appearing. Now, this is just a few verses from what we're reading in verse one. So in context, Paul is referring back to that day, those who have loved his appearing. We know in verse one that he is the judge of the living and the dead at his appearing. It's the same word. So, so then link this together. The only, the only judgment in which you are going to be granted a crown of righteousness is the Bema Seat judgment. So, it, so this is how I'm getting this, is that Paul says that he is going to be granted a crown of righteousness, not only to him, but also those who have loved his appearing. And then in verse 1, he says that he is the righteous judge, and, and he's going to judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So I think that that right there, the fact that Paul in verse 8 refers to that day that he's going to be getting uh, the crown of righteousness, and that we're going to be loving his appearing, I think it's, it's so closely related that this has to be the Bema Seat Judgment. That's why I believe that whenever he's writing this letter to Timothy, he's placing this in front of it. It's an encouragement. It's a, it's a letter of hope to Timothy. And so I don't believe he would be writing this letter of hope about the sheep and goat judgment. I think he's writing it about when you're going to get, you yourself are going to get the crown of righteousness because you're faithful. So that's my conjecture. There are plenty of people that don't agree with me, but I just, that's the way I see see it here. All right. So with this in mind, let's talk about who the living and the dead would be 
if this is truly the beam of seat judgment. So he's going to judge, and at the time, it's at, he's going to judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So who are the living and the dead at this appearing? Go with me to 1 Thessalonians 4.15. Just back a couple of pages. 1 Thessalonians 4.15. So he says in verse 15, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are, are asleep. For, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ... That's the dead he's talking about. The dead who are in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, okay, this is the judge of the living and the dead. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together, shall be harpazo. That's the word for rapture. That's where we get it. We'll be raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What an encouragement of hope, right? That's what, and so that judgment of living and the dead, I believe, is what's happening at the rapture because the rapture, in a sense, is a judgment. He's coming down and he's, he's rapturing those that were faithful. He's rapturing the Christians who were faithful, whether they're dead or alive, that's their rap, he's being, they're being raptured up and then they're being placed in front of the Bema seat judgment and he's judging them. See, that's what's happening here. And so that's the, the living and the dead at this time of his appearing. Okay, so then he goes on, and we, now we need to understand what does he mean by in accordance with his kingdom. So he's, he's judging the living and the dead in accordance with his appearing. So now we all understand that. He's judging the living and the dead at the rapture. And then he's also, this is in accordance with his appearing because his epiphania is coming whenever he, he rescues us and, and uh, catches us away into heaven. Now it's in accordance with his kingdom. So these rewards that we are handed out at the Bema Seat Judgment, that is the, that's what's in accordance with his kingdom. And I'm going to show you this. this is, it's in accordance with his kingdom. I think that's why it's so important that we understand it's, it's according to, not just at. Because that's where people, I think, make the mistake that if, if it was at his kingdom, well, that's the point whenever he's setting up his millennial kingdom. This is in accordance with his kingdom. That's a little bit different. Okay, so the things that are our rewards that are according to his kingdom, that what that means is that these rewards are going to be demonstrating throughout the entire kingdom for all eternity, our rewards are demonstrated. Okay, so whenever we're rewarded with a crown of righteousness, our rewards are demonstrated to the kingdom for all eternity. Our rewards determine the level of our service for all eternity in his kingdom. See, this is why walking in the good works that he's prepared for us now and being faithful to him now set us up for how our eternal life is actually going to function. And it's going to be determined, it's going to determine our level of service in the kingdom. So our rewards in heaven will work in accordance with his earthly kingdom because this, the rewards are what tell us that we're going to be reigning with him in his kingdom. That's how it works in accordance with his kingdom. So Jesus has a couple of examples. Jesus says in Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. That's a reigning. We are going to be granted a reward of reigning with him for all eternity as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That is an amazing exaltation of us that he is going to grant us to reign with him who is the righteous judge. I want that. I think you just said that, too, right, Steve? <laughs> this is awesome. I love Revelation 5. This is Revelation 5, whenever we're standing before the lamb and we're singing to the lamb. Listen to what we're going to be saying here. It's, this is the 24 elders who represent those that were raptured 
at, at this time, at his appearing. So listen to this. This is Revelation 5. You are worthy to take the scroll. This is what we're singing to the Lamb. We're, we're, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. So look at this, this perspective now. This is a, a really interesting thing to think about as far as timing goes, because what's happening here is those Christians, those faithful Christians were raptured, and they're standing now before the throne, and they're seeing the Lamb of God take the scroll out of the Father's hand. What is it that triggers the 70th week of Daniel, the Great Tribulation? It's the opening of the seals that are on that scroll. So now listen to this. This proves a pre-tribulation rapture because how else are those Christians there in front of the throne seeing the Lamb if we weren't raptured before the tribulation? Because they're seeing the, the scroll opened one seal at a time and they're seeing the Lamb of God take the scroll to be able to do this. This can only happen before the tribulation. So I think that's a really interesting thing on timing. This proves pre-tribulation right there. There's many discussions on this from good scholars and good Christian people but I think this right here, as I was studying this, this, this week, it's like, that's the timing. That's it. We're seeing, we who are raptured are seeing the Lamb of God taking the title deed from the Father, that's the scroll, opening up the seals, and that starts the 70th week of Daniel. So anyway, that's a really fun to think, but, but it's a fun thing to think about. But listen to this at the end. We shall reign on the earth. So the, the reward of this of being raptured and going through the Bema seat is that we will reign on the earth. This now goes back to the thousand year reign after the tribulation when we now ride down behind Jesus Christ as he's coming down for the sheep and goat judgment and to set up his millennial kingdom. This goes to your question, Jim. The, we now are who are reigning with him are following him to, uh, in, uh, to judge the sheep and goat judgment. We're following Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, and we're following him down. So to answer your question, Jim, we who are reigning with him are not the ones being judged at the sheep and goat judgment. Our judgment, it was already in, in heaven at the Bema seat. Does that make sense? So that's the special privilege that we have as his bride, those that are raptured and caught away with him. And we see the glorious things of, of God in heaven while the tribulation is going on down on the earth. And then we come back to the earth with him. And that's whenever he says, we will reign on the earth in the millennial kingdom. Okay, so now another one, 2 Timothy 2.11. We just studied this a couple of weeks ago or several weeks ago. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. All right, that's great. Amen. We are, if, you, if you died and gave your life to Jesus Christ, you will live eternally with him. But he gives us a special privilege, a special reward for those who endure and who are faithful. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. See, those that just die with him don't necessarily reign with him. Those that are living with him aren't necessarily going to reign with him. It's only those who endure and are faithful and are caught up at, to be at the Bema Seat Judgment. Those are the ones who will reign with him. See, that's the special privilege. That's what we want to be striving for in our faithfulness. And that's why he gave us scripture so he can prepare us and we can be prepared for every good work so we can be a part of what God's given us here. So now this idea of standing before Jesus, who is the righteous judge, this was always in the forefront of Paul's mind, right? This is everything he did, he had this picture in his mind. And so we're going to spend more time on verse 8, and we're going to be talking more about that idea when we get to verse 8. But just as a, a quick recap, a quick look at this, that he always had a sense of urgency to pursue and do the will of God, because that's what it takes to pursue and have a faithful heart of pursuance towards Jesus Christ. That's what gives you the ticket to be caught away and go to the Bema seat. That's what I believe. Okay, so now a couple of just things. We're just going to go through these quick. Again, we're going to go through these in verse 8. But 1 Corinthians 9, this is why Paul said, I run the race to obtain a prize and not be disqualified. Well, Paul's not saying he's going to be disqualified from salvation, right? He's not worried about that. So what is he worried about being disqualified from? 
about being disqualified from receiving the crown of righteousness at the beam of seat judgment and the rapture. That's what he's worried about being disqualified from. So he's, he's Philippians 3.12. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's pressing toward something. He's not just laying back. He's pressing toward so that he can obtain that, that upward prize, the, the prize of the upward call. I believe that upward call is being his bride because not everybody, those, those that are unfaithful are not going to be his bride. Philippians 3.8, he suffers loss so that he may gain Christ. That's a prerequisite. We have to, we have to give up this life so we can gain him. Philippians 3.11, he does this to attain the resurrection from the dead. The, re the resurrection from the dead. He has to do, he needs to do something to attain the resurrection from the dead. So what does that mean? I believe that's the rapture. Being resurrected, getting our glorified bodies at the catching away of the saints. I think the resurrection of the dead in that point is, is what Paul's you know, pointing towards. So as Paul draws near to the end of his life and he's handing his mantle to his son, he wants Timothy to have this same urgency. This is the urgency Paul had. This is what he wants his son in the faith to have. This is what he wants Timothy to carry this on and to keep this urgency going. So Paul's reminding Timothy to stay the course, fight the good fight of faith, and lay hold on eternal life. We lay hold on eternal life by doing these things, fighting the good fight of faith here in this life so that we can lay hold on eternal life. Now, the modern church, especially in the West here, as we are in America, has lost this sense of urgency about Christ's return. So I'm not talking about us in this room, because, but I'm just looking at us in general as a Western church in America. We have lost the urgency of Christ's return. So in the first century, there was persecution and there was suffering and the concept of Jesus' imminent return was, was their main focus. The fact that they were constantly looking for Jesus to come back through persecution and suffering because they were, they were being persecuted. They didn't know if they were going to live the next day or not because most of them actually died for being a Christian. So their hope wasn't that they would have a better life. Their hope was that they would have eternal life with Jesus Christ. That's what we're missing in America. I think that there's too much at-homeness in the world, in the West, and we have gotten distracted with all of our nice privileges in the West, and we have lost this sense of urgency that Paul's trying to tell us in the Second Timothy. We've gotten way too comfortable living in this world, and so we've lost this, in, in, this expectancy because whenever you're living in your nice house and we've got air conditioning and TV and we can watch anything we want and, you know, there's all that stuff, there, there's no reason to be looking and earnestly expecting Jesus Christ to return because there's, what, what do we need to be redeemed from? See, we have this mixed concept and it's absolutely wrong right? That's, we have to get that out of our mind. So what we need to do, I like my air conditioned house. I do like those things, <laughs> but I'm saying that we don't have to give those up to be more holy or anything like that. But what we need to do is we need to have this sense of urgency towards Jesus Christ and everything we do, we need to be for him. Right? So as we're living in our air-conditioned house, that can't be everything. We need to lay, be able to lay that aside in the blink of an eye, and we need to focus on Jesus Christ. And that's where we don't compromise the truth. We don't, we don't do, we, we're willing to lay aside and to suffer loss so that we can have him for eternity. That's what we have to do in America today. And so this message is that we don't have to just go out and give up those things and live in poverty and start whipping ourselves in the back just to suffer so we can have his eternal glory. That's, you know, many people thought that's the way you do it. You don't do that. You just start making every decision that you have right now for the glory of Jesus Christ. Everything we do has to be looking to his return. We need to have an urgency and an earnestness being watchful and expectant for his return. That's what we need to be focusing on every minute of every day. 
our English Bible, it doesn't translate this, but going back to this verse one, he says, who will judge the living and the dead? The Greek actually says, melontes krinane. And what that means is it's an untranslated word here, this melontes, and it means who is about to judge. Now think about this. Read that now, that he who is about to judge the living and the dead. That's different than just him who is going to judge the living and the dead. Him who is about to judge the living and the dead. This is teaching his imminent return. This means that we live every single day like he's going to be coming right now so that we can be caught away as his bride. But we don't make the mistake of just sitting around and waiting for him to come because that's what the Thessalonians did and Paul rebuked him for that. So you don't do that. You don't just sit around and say, I'm waiting for him. No, you press toward the prize of the high calling. You start fulfilling and walking in the good works that he has prepared us for. What you do is you preach the word. That's what he's telling us. We preach the word as we go, and we're not slothful. We're, we're faithful in him, and we preach the word every single day to whoever we can so that we can be living and having, being, showing us faithful, showing ourselves faithful to him. Amen. So this needs to be rooted in our everyday life, in our everyday decisions, and I love Titus 2.11 because this is our blessed hope. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's sanctification. That's what the scriptures are doing. It's bringing us sanctification, and it's teaching us this. And the whole time we're walking in the good works that he's prepared for us, Look at verse 13. We're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're constantly looking. I have a funny story. I, was, I, was, I just built a deck. I wasn't planning on saying this, but I think it'd be fun to share you. Uh, I was building a deck, and it was kind of a big deck, and I put up a bunch of lights, and I was tired, and I fell asleep on my couch, and then I, I woke up, and it was night, and I had turned on the lights, and I looked outside, and the lights were so bright <laughs> that it just looked like bright light, and my eyes were still kind of sleepy, and I was like, is this it? Is Jesus coming back? <laughs> you know? It's like, that's it. We, everything, yeah, I was ready. That's the thing. It was a test, right? So, no, everything we do, this is it. He's coming, right? That's what has to be in the forefront of our mind. I love the end of our Bible, right? The end of our Bible, the way Revelation ends, this is exactly what we have in our hearts every single day. Jesus gives us the assurance. He gives us this promise. He says, surely I am coming quickly. And then John says, amen, even so, come, Lord Jesus, right? Come, Lord Jesus. He's promised that he is coming, yes, Come, Lord Jesus. That's our hope every single day. So Paul describes Jesus as this righteous judge to remind Timothy to remain faithful to the word, always remember to whom he serves. We're serving the righteous judge. Paul makes this solemn charge to Timothy and he authenticates it by setting it before the highest possible authority who is the righteous judge who is coming and will judge everyone. He's going to judge us as Christians at the Bema seat, the sheep and goat judgment, the great white throne. He's saying, this is the righteous judge who will judge everyone and I'm laying this in front of you. So therefore, by laying this foundation, he charges Timothy by saying, preach the word. That's that's the authority behind this. So let's wrap up. This is the last thing we're going to read today. Let's just wrap up moving into next week. And I want to read, I'm going to start with verse one again. I'm going to read one into verse two. He says, I charge you. I'm earnestly charging and solemnly exhorting to you. I'm solemnly testifying to you, Timothy. Therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead according to his appearing and according to his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So this mandate, this is the mandate for all Christians that we have until his glorious appearing, and that is to preach the word. All right. So we'll study what that means to preach the word next week. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up with prayer. Thank you so much, Father, for your word, for your 
your logos that you sent to us in your glorious, his glorious appearing that we might know salvation through him and then through this we might know eternal life in him by being faithful to what he's given us. Father, just work in us. Dokimazo me now. Test me and examine me and prove me genuine so that I can be a faithful servant to you in this life so I can reign eternally with you in everlasting life. Father, give me the strength and all of us here, the strength to preach your word without compromise and without any tolerance that we only stand for the truth and we stand alongside you. In this name, this precious name of Jesus, amen. amen.